All right, here we go. Back in the grammar, chapter 15, page 165. Just took our quiz on the um, perfect endings or subformatives, and now we will get into the cow imperfect for strong verbs. Now, what we have for strong verbs, we'd be in clover, right? But you get some um, exceptions with the weak verbs. We'll deal with that in the next chapter. Um, 165, strong verbs. All right. <coughs> we have done the uh, first major tense or aspect of Hebrew verbs. Uh, the perfect. What kind of action is the perfect tense? Completed. 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 What kind of action is the imperfect tense? Not completed. Not completed. Okay, very good. All right, introduction. The imperfect is the second major Hebrew verbal conjugation to be studied. Of the over 50,000 occurrences of the cow stem in the Hebrew Bible, the imperfect conjugation occurred conjugation occur 21,951 times, so almost half of them. Approximately 42% of cow stem occurrences. Like the perfect conjunction, sorry, like the perfect conjugation, the imperfect inflects or changes its form in order to indicate person, gender, and number. So, same sort of thing that we did with the perfect, right? Um, singular and plural, right? Third person, second person, first person, and masculine and feminine. Remember that? All right, very similar with the imperfect. All right, bottom of paragraph 15.2, <coughs> to state it differently, the imperfect aspect denotes an incomplete action, whether in the past, present, or future. Typically, you know, this is determined by context, by word choice and things like that, but typically you're going to be translating an imperfect as a present tense in English or a future, or a future tense in English. All right, the form of cal imperfect, we're going to have some um, subformatives. Not all of them will have a subformative, but they will all have a preformative or a prefix. So, on page 166, <coughs> you will see the forms for the cal imperfect of the strong verb. Now, here's how we have to learn this one. We're not going to learn just the endings or just the preformatives on this one. We're going to learn the whole word on this one. We're going to learn how to spell the entire word on this. <coughs> so to learn how to pronounce this paradigm properly is going to be important so that we can um, write it uh, more easily. So you need to be able to say it, and you need to be able to write it. Again, our paradigm verb is katal. Remember that? Yes. And so you're going to notice that the um, third person masculine preformative is going to be a yo with the hiric under it, which is different than the hiric yo. This is yo hiric, right? Uh, three fs is going to be a tav. Uh, the second person are all tav, and the first person singular is olive. In the plural, the third masculine plural is yo. Third feminine plural and all the second person are, have a performative of tav, and the first common plural has a performative of nu. Now, notice that none of the singulars have a subformative except the second feminine singular. Notice that the second feminine singular has a heric yod subformative. Notice that that looks like a first common singular pronominal suffix, doesn't it? All right, so don't confuse that. It's completely different. It just by chance happens to look the same. All right, it has nothing to do with that. Um, and notice that all of the plurals have a subformative except the first common plural. Okay. So just to notice those things. Um, but the way you're really going to remember it is just to remember the paradigm. Yikto, tikto, tikto, tiktoli, ekto. You kind of have to be a little bit like a rap singer here because you've got to get a beat going. All right? You can even... Slap your, snap your fingers. Now, notice that the third feminine singular and the second masculine singular are alike. They're identical in form. Okay? So, they're, um, they're just ambiguous form. 
Um, notice that's the third feminine plural and the second feminine plural are alike. Ambiguous form. Alright? So, gipto, tikto, tikto, tiktali, ekto. Yiktalu, tiktolna, tiktalu, tiktolna, nikto. Okay, so you need to just memorize that. Notice the spelling. Um, on all the performatives, you have a period underneath, except for the olive, which gets a cigar. Okay? And notice then the second letter, or the first root letter, uh, always has a shiva under it. So that's pretty easy, right? And you can hear that in the way we pronounce it. Yikto, tikto, 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 ekto. Right? So you can hear that shiva, you can hear the hiric under most of those. I'm just reading the tikto, tikto, we. Alright, page 166. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it says, in perfect paradigm, right between the formative and preformative. Mm-hmm. I'm just reading down those words right there. Yikto, tikto, 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 ekto. Yiktolu, tiktolna, tiktolu, tiktolna, nikto. Okay. So, where do you have our stem, a typical stem valve for this paradigm is a colon, isn't it? Do you see that? The stem valve is the valve that goes with the second root letter, the middle root letter. Right? Some of them don't have the typical stem valve. When they don't have the typical stem valve, there is a shava. Like in 3MP. Like in 3MP, exactly. Like in 2FS. Um, <coughs> or in other words, usually if there is just a vowel used as a, as a subformative. If, 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 the subformative, if there is a subformative and it's just a vowel, then you can get that double if you want. Okay. Now, if the subformative is not, consonant and a vowel, adding a whole another um, syllable, all right, then the um, colon state. Okay. So let's say it together. Yikto, tikto, tikto, tiktoli, ekto. Yiktolu, tiktolna, tiktolu, tiktolna, nikto. Okay. Now just spend lots of time saying those, saying them as you look at them, remembering how to spell it. And if you say it right, it's not too hard to know how to spell it. Yik to remember katal is your paradigm verb. Kof tate not tov, right? Kof tate lama. Okay. Um, so yik to so you can hear that. Yod ka shiva tate kolam lama. Yik to tik to. Tick to tick to Now just remember that tick to that's a vocalized shiva. Right? Tick yik to tick to tick to tick to So that's pretty easy to spell. Ta dogish lane with a hiri under it. Ko shiva silent shiva. Te shiva vocalized shiva. Lamed hiri kyo. Right? So it's, this is not that hard really to learn. I mean, you've got to work at it, right? But if, if, you, if, you, if you can say it, you can probably spell it. So say it again. Yik to, tik 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 to, So tik to, how would you spell that? Noon, hiric, ka, Shiva, Sana Shiva, Nick told Tate, Polan, Lamed. Right, so that gets one Shiva, doesn't it? Yeah. So you can, you can tell how to spell it just by how you're saying it. So that's not too hard, right? See how that's formed? So where we had blank, ah, ta, t, u, tem, ten, nu, those subformatives telling us our. Uh, 
gender, number, and person. Now we have preformatives along with some subformatives telling us those same things. Now, how are you going to um, recognize the difference between an imperfect and a perfect? Well, uh, what again? What about? Other than just knowing the forms, but what? I mean, what, what's the big glaring difference? Performatives. Perfects don't have performatives. At least not like the imperfects do. Right? So that's, that's the big glaring distinction. Okay, now when we're, we're learning these verb forms, the two big issues that we need to deal with, right, um, in, in terms of um, learning the forms, the two big issues that we need to deal with are, uh, number one, can we tell what the vocabulary form is? Now, we didn't learn this paragram in new, uh, paradigm, and uh, you just saw... Um, take toll now. You know, what's the vocabulary? Right. Might be hard to know what that vocabulary is. You know, this paradigm, you know, oh, that's how is a performative, so I'm going to take that off. That's not part of the vocabulary. So you can tell what the vocabulary is. Remember, I said that the battle for Hebrew is won or lost on knowing what the vocabulary word is, so you can look it up, right? That's not so hard with strong verbs. That becomes more difficult with weak words. Right? And so what we need to remember is we want to be able to, um, to to familiarize ourselves enough with these forms so that we can recognize the vocabulary form, number one. Number two, distinguish it from other forms. So we're going to want to be able to distinguish the perfect from the imperfect all the way through. And we're going to want to learn them well enough so that we can distinguish a cow from a PL, from a nipple, from a hifil, from a hit pahel, from a, ha, ha, a hopeful, uh, and so forth. Right? So those are our issues. We want to be able to recognize the vocabulary form and distinguish the word from uh, alternate tenses, which might be perfect or imperfect or jussive or imperative or infinitive construct, infinitive absolute. Right? So we need to be able to distinguish those things. The other ones are, I mean, um, the game of distinguishing between um, tense or aspect is relatively easy. Right? Um, what becomes more difficult is to be able to distinguish one stint, cow, pia, or nickel from another. But there are some pretty good hints with those. Again, all of these things are going to be very straightforward and relatively easy in strong verbs. If you have a strong verb, you're going to be able to pick out the vocabulary form, and it's going to follow the typical pattern that we've learned. And even just knowing P A L is going to help you um, with uh, recognizing the tense. Just knowing NIFL is going to help you with recognizing the tense. Okay? Uh, the difficulty comes when you get to weak verbs. So, you know, the better you know the weak verbs, um, the easier it's going to be for you. Uh, bottom line is, when you have a weak verb, um, you're probably going to have to look a lot of them up. Just to know what they are, for sure, right? Because there are just so many exceptions. All right, so let's say that again. Yikto, tikto, 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 li, ekto, yikto, lu, tikto, na, tikto, lu, tikto, na, nikto. You start to already get it? So, so get those down uh, really well. And. Have these ever had a file? Two MP. Would the two MP ever have a file? The end. The two MP ever have a final what? A noon at the end. I think I read that somewhere. Um. Yeah. So there is a paradigmic noon that can show up. I'm trying to remember if that's how would we know, or, or how would you know? Um. That's probably a rare exception. Well, it's somewhat rare, and I, I so so number eight, eight or one sixty-seven is that you're talking about? That oh. one is called the noon. Yeah, oh, that's oh, right. Number eight on the next page. Three MP and the two MP forms were written with the final noon. Um, the final noon is called a noon paragogicum. Um, if that's how you pronounce the Latin paragogicum. Uh, verbs with this final noon may also be spelled defectively. 
And so instead of saying loon with the shirik, you would use a sigil, a um, uh, sigil, a no, no, I'm going to switch on the name of that though. Um, I'll remember. Maybe you can help me. Kaboots? Uh, Kaboots, yeah, that's right. Sorry. That's right. All right. <coughs> now notice number nine on the, uh, the next page. Uh, he's giving you your uh, diagnostic indicators. One diagnostic indicator is the hearing under the performative, although there's an exception to that. Remember, the first common singular uh, has a sigol under the ala. Right? The uh, another diagnostic indicator is the colon stem vowel. You see that? Um, I would also add to that the um, shiva under the first root letter is something to keep in mind as well, as indicating a cow being perfect. But is it obvious, or wouldn't the performative also be a diagnostic indicator? It's a diagnostic for the for the uh, imperfect tense, but we're also concerned about diagnostics for the cow imperfect as opposed to the PL imperfect, the field imperfect, blah, 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 blah. Right. But yeah, the, the, the preformative is, is the big clue that you don't have a perfect tense. You got an imperfect tense. Or maybe adjusted. It's going to turn out that the adjusted is going to have the same form as the imperfect. And context can tell us whether it's imperfect or adjusted. Okay. And the difference would be um, Yikto, he will kill. Uh, Yikto is adjusted, um, he may kill, or may he kill, or something like that. It's sort of a mild imperative. We'll, we'll get to that. We don't need to Yes? Are the forms are the same? How do we make this distinction? Context. Gotcha. That's what I have to do. So if we go and we, you know, are doing parsing, and you say, parse this verb, we can put either one of them? Well, if it doesn't have a context, but it's kind of like in Greek, there are some verbs you can't parse outside of context. Amen. You know, so I can't parse it. Yeah. So you always want to try to parse a verb into in context, if possible. Right. Now, some verbs you can parse outside of context, so there's no ambiguity to the form. But some of the verbs have an ambiguous forms in the context. All right, you can see the chart on page 168, and notice that this, these same forms are applied to different verbs. So if you take Zakar, for, for example, instead of Yikto, Tikto, you get uh, Yizkor, Tizkor, Tizkor, Tizkori, Ezkor. That would almost be a funner one to have. Mm -hmm. That flows off the tongue, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Or Yikto. Tiptoe, tiptoe, tip to the ecto. Well, it sounds the same, doesn't it? Only with different consonants, because that's the way it works. That's the way it is. Any questions about that? Now, remember, we had um, stated verbs that uh, were an issue with the perfect. They're also an issue with the imperfect. Look at the um, bottom of page 168, paragraph 15.6. <coughs> These stative verbs, um, there are stative verbs like gadal, means to be great. Um, there is not an apparent difference in the perfect tense because that follows the pattern that we're used to with the perfect tense, right? See where I'm at? But when you get to the imperfect, instead of yig dole, it's yig dal. That's okay. Uh, I still have. A performative with a hierarch under it. I still have a shiva under the first root letter, so I'm good to go. Right? Um, <coughs> Kaved in the imperfect gets to be yikvad with a patak. And katone to be small in the, in the uh, perfect gets to be yikton. So notice all the stated verbs end up with the patak where we had a hole before, right? 
So instead of yig dol, it's yig dol. Instead of yik vod, it's yik vod. Instead of yik tone, it's yik tone. See that? So just mark that. <coughs> mark that in your mind and be aware of the fact that it works that way with stative verbs. The whole paradigm of those verbs is in that chart on page 169 if you want to see it. All right? He repeats what he said before about lexical form. Uh, lexical form for most imperfect verbs is the Cal perfect 3 MS. Um, nothing's changed, right? So you're not going to see yik tol in the dictionary. You're going to see what? Katal in the dictionary. Um, part same, same thing, only where he says you don't have to give the dictionary definition. I'd like you to give the def uh, dictionary definition. So when you're parsing, you are parsing for the, uh, the verbal stem, the conjugation or tense or aspect, however you want to call it, person, gender, number, and the verbal root with the de definition. So, um, yish ma'u, see that? Now, what's it from? Shema, to hear. So I will go in my mind, yikto, tikto, tikto, tiktoli, ekto, I haven't nailed it yet. Yiktalu. Or I can look at myself and say, okay, in the first one in the singular and the first one in the plural start with a yod. So that's what we have. Let's just try that. Yiktol or yiktalu. Okay. So I have a 3MP here. Right? So I know it's imperfect because I've got a proof form here. So cal, imperfect, 3MP from Shema to here. Now I put the dictionary definition down. It doesn't matter if it's the dictionary definition or the definition of the word uh, as we are given it here, they will hear. But if I were parsing, I'd say Shema to hear. Right. Um, now if you go to uh, Yim Lok, right? Well, again, if it's going to be a Yod, it's going to probably be third person, right? And if it doesn't have a suffix, it's probably going to be singular. The suffix is going to be plural. So I can think of yiktol, tiktol, tiktol, tiktoli, ektol, yiktolu, tiktolna, tiktolu, tiktolna, niktol, until I find what I want here. But I can see already that I have a 3ns from what? Malak to uh, rain. So Calum perfect 3ms from Malak to rain, or he will rain, or be king, or something. Right? Following that? So it's not all that different from the, the perfect, only different. <laughs> right. Same as the perfect, just different. Questions up to this point? All right. <clears throat> negation of the imperfect. Typically, uh, for a negation of an imperfect, you will have low. It's possible to have all, but that's one of the ways we're going to distinguish. If you have a negative particle with a form like this, um, then you can usually distinguish between an imperfect and a jussive because a jussive is going to take all. Um, just like in Greek, who was with the indicative and made outside the indicative here. Um, Lo was with the imperative um, and perfect, and all will be with the jussive. It is possible to use uh, all with an imperative too. But he, he makes an interesting point the Ten Commandments. Um, Lo which is always placed immediately before the verb, by the way. Um, lo has the meaning of an absolute or permanent prohibition. So, uh, you shall not make, um, or you shall not take, or you shall not kill. Those are absolute or permanent prohibitions. Right? Uh, if you had all um, used with an imperfect verb, uh, yeah, that's to express an immediate or specific or non-durative prohibition. Right? Now, do not write in the book. Well, that's for that moment. Right? It may change later. Uh, do not fear. Well, it might be appropriate to fear later, but right now, for this reason, do not fear. Right? Um, and so on. Now, notice um, the footnote number three. He talks about all with the imperative. Well, he says, see also the discussion on the justice. Typically, if you have an all with an imperative form, you're going to be thinking just it. Okay. All right, is that pretty clear, the, Im the imperfect tense? That's not really too hard. The state of verbs, the only way that you know, I mean, all verbs that have a thought necessary are all of them in the middle constant of the data. Is that what that would say? 
Yeah, but it's not so important. It's not so important to look at it that way, but but to look at it backwards, in a sense. You, you know, they're stated verbs because um, you know the vocabulary and the meaning, right? So to be small, to be great, to be heavy, you know, or whatever. Um, you already know that's a stated concept, right? Um, so when you see that, you'll go, oh, well, that's that way because it's stated. So it's, it's not so much you're going to, I don't think, you're going to be able to recognize the form and go, oh, that must be a stated verb. Um, you're going to see a stated verb and go, why is that form different? Oh, that's because it's a stated verb. If you just remember that the stated verbs can be spelled differently uh, in the last part of the stem, then that's just what's going to happen. Okay. So remember, um, the probably, probably by far the most important thing you can do is learn the vocabulary. Because right? if you're starting with a good vocabulary base, that's, that's really going to help you. Um, when we come to the final, you know, this is only this is the second to the last class period. Next class period, we get to hand out the final for this term. It's coming fast. Isn't it? wow. So, you know, what's what's important to know? Okay, there's really a relatively limited amount of stuff that's important to know for the final. I mean, there are all kinds of rules and things like that. But you know, now what we struggled with in the beginning is pretty much all the stuff, right? We're not struggling with consonants and vowels and stuff like that too much. Right? That's the task. Yeah. But, you know, I might ask you to write out the alphabet for the final and you think it's fair game, right? But um, what you really need to know up to this point in the book what you really need to know is vocabulary. Fr from, from the grammar, what am I going to test you on? Basically. Right? I'm not going to test you on, on the minutiae and stuff like that. You know, don't, don't worry about that. You know, I might ask you to write out the alphabet. I might ask you to identify the names of uh, vowels or something like that. But, but the big thing is vocabulary, right? Um, and, and the forms we've learned, the major forms we've learned, which are endings for the noun, right? Um, including the absolute endings and the construct endings. So those two sets of endings, right? Remember those? Uh, the pronominal suffix endings. Remember those? Um, then the endings for the perfect tense and the forms for the imperfect, cal perfect and the cal imperfect tense. All right. So those are the big things you need to know from the grammar. The vocabulary, the noun endings, the pronominal suffixes, um, the uh, endings for the cal perfect and the forms of the cal imperfect. Did you say the test would be a take home or are we going to take it next week? Take home. And I don't remember, I'll show a look. Um, when do we meet again after next week? Is it the very next week for the break? Oh, uh, next week's the last week, isn't it? Next week is the last week for this term. So when do we start the next term? I think it's March. I think it's March 6th. So, sure. so we get a break then, don't we? I think there's one or two weeks. I don't have a so, no, so there's a break. So you'll have, you'll have a week to do this. Huh? You're teaching one time? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to finish out the book. Okay, you taught before, this is the first time. This is summary for when you taught. Oh, I've taught uh, for some time at, at uh, Southwestern Bible College. Uh, I taught uh, while well, I was at seminary, then in my seminary, then I taught at Western Seminary. I taught at Phoenix Seminary uh, in Phoenix. While I was pastoring, and I taught here. However, this is the very first time I've ever taught, beginning here. It's all this is, you know, this teaching thing of beginning here is new. I've done a lot of study in Hebrew, but I never actually taught I always wanted to, so this is kind of fun that I kind of need to do. I've had a lot of beginning Greek though before this. Um, so, with all that teaching, I should be doing better. Huh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, that was the first time I ever taught it. <laughs> Um, all right, now, I think in a sense, in a sense, in one sense, the hardest stuff is really yet to come in the grammar, but it's really kind of so hard 
that we're not going to really try to learn it all, right? Yes. Um, we're going to kind of we're going to kind of learn to feel our way through it a little bit. We're going to um, you know we're going to we're going to rely on um, experience in the Hebrew text to teach us some of this stuff, right? I mean, if, I think if you try to, to literally, you probably could, you probably could memorize every rule and every exception in this grammar. But a normal human being could not even come close to doing that at the pace that we're going through the grammar. If you literally want to take 12 months or something to get through this grammar, you might be able to, you know, really remember every rule and every exception and every spelling and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not sure that's even worth it uh, at that point. Um, <coughs> so once we get through the, the Cal imperfect, um, you know, there'll be some, obviously some other things to, to learn along the way. But we're, at that point, we're going to be just trying to recognize how is a nifal different from what we've learned? How is a pl different from what we've learned? How is a hifil typically different from what we've learned? And we got to learn participles. We got to learn infinitives. We got to learn, uh, you know, justives and imperatives and stuff like that. But that's not going to be as involved as what we've done, right? I mean, the first couple of weeks we were just entrenched and overwhelmed in the alphabet and the vowels, right? Remember that? Um, you know, now that's you know we're way beyond that and we're overwhelmed by other stuff. Um, what's going to happen for next term is we're going to kind of switch and instead of having to spend so much time you know, trying to get you know, what is a kibbutz sometimes slips our you know, what is, what is this and everything uh, we're going to be concentrating on the Hebrew text and learning to deal with the Hebrew text and, and gain from our experience in the Hebrew text um Instead of just kind of trying to memorize, you know, huge amounts of just rules and spellings and forms and stuff like that, right? So, so I think there's a sense in which we have, um, from the standpoint of our nose and the grammar, after tonight, gotten through the hard part of it. Right? The hardness will switch because now we'll have our nose in the Hebrew text and we'll have to deal with that. But I'd always rather have my nose in the Bible than the grammar anyway, right? So it was a golden edition book by the end of the term. Yes, that's right. And so uh, we have, uh, by the end of this term, we'll be through uh, number 17, right? Which should be well uh, toward half of the way through the grammar. So there are 35, uh, 35 chapters, 36. And uh, we'll have done 17 of them. So we're almost out of the grammar. But you know, look at look at the second page of the table uh, of contents, and I'm, I'm not really thrilled about the way this is laid out because you know, we did now we did all the noun stuff, and now we're doing all the verb stuff, and so we've waited you know almost a second term to even deal with the verb, right? I'm not sure that's the best way to do that. But from now on out, we virtually have uh, nothing but stems and. Well, it's in the second page of the table of contents, that's what we have. Nibal stem strong verb, nibal stem weak verb. Repeat that for the PL, repeat that for the PUAL, repeat that for the HIFIL, repeat that for the HOFO, repeat that for the HITPAYO. That's where we're going. And in all of those things, it is how do we distinguish this one from the rest of them? All right? A couple of rules, and then bam. There you go. That's it. Now, we were talking about the final. So from the grammar, right? We, we, I told you what you might need to know from the grammar. Remember, anything's fair game, but I'm not going to get real crazy detail on it. Um, also, um, from probably your workbook, translation and parsing. Um, so... If you know those things that you're, you're supposed to know from the grammar, right, vocabulary and the forms, you should 
be able to translate and parse anything I give you. <laughs> Just based on that knowledge, right? Vocabulary and form. If you want to study for that part of it, you know, you hopefully you've been going through your workbook, you know, you go back over your workbook and look at some of the things that you uh, have been translated in the workbook and uh, you know, those sorts of things. So there's kind of a preview, a pre preview of the uh, it's like a pro pre tonic. Um, so this is a pro preview of the final uh, week ahead. Of time. Yes. That's kind of the neat thing about if you you can write down the stuff, all the different endings from the grammar. Then you uh, basically you'll be able to write down your own cheat sheet for the parsing and all the translating because you'll be able to just reference it. And, oh, that matches up with that. And that that's a good deal. Absolutely. However, as I think you'll understand, you'll have to write down that cheat sheet from memory after you start the test. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but you're right. In some sense, the test itself will become its own cheat sheet. In a sense. As long as you do it right. Yeah, as long as you do it right. Which is pretty neat. All right. Um, so you can tell that in terms of what you really have to have down cold, there's only a fraction in Hebrew here as compared to what we had to know in Greek, right? Um, but you can tell that the exceptions and differences and all of that in Hebrew, you know, are astronomical compared to what you have in Greek. And so the challenge in Hebrew is dealing with, dealing with just a pure volume of exceptions. Um, that's, that's the challenge. And, and I think you really have to deal with that just by... Um, time and experience in the text. And that's why I think the philosophy that Dr. House has and the school has of doing a lot of reading in the original languages and having actual, you know, do the beginning grammar and then the next thing you do is a whole term on just Greek reading or Hebrew reading. Uh, that's very useful, very smart. So when you're getting to that term of Hebrew reading, um, you know, that's just time in the text and getting used to the exceptions. And there are some words that occur very frequently that um, you know don't go according to the norm. We've seen all over. You know, Vayomer, and he said, Vayomer, that's a cow, um, imperfect, with a reversing vowel on it, um, but it's not following the spelling we just learned, right? It's not. It's not yikto. It's uh, yotel, right? Um, which is a different spelling. But you'll see Vayomer so many times. You know, that's one of the things I'll be able to call you up at two in the morning. What's about Yomer? Calum Perfect through MS. He said, <laughs> you know, uh, via he, that's irregular. Don't have to do it. That's, you already know that, right? And he, it happened, or whatever, and it came about. <clears throat> All right, so vocabulary page 171. Hiya! Hayah. Hayah. That is, uh, well, I'm sorry, I mispronounced it. Hayah would be, what would Hayah be? No, it be. It's a B. It's a B. This one is Hayah. Remember, Hay means life. I think we had that, right? Uh, Hayah means to live. Uh, Yakol. To be able. Now, there's a word that. Um, is fairly frequent, but it's not following um, the typical spelling, is it? Right. Um, so we want to note that to be able. Karat. Karat. To cut off or to make a covenant. So in Hebrew Bible, it speaks literally of cutting a covenant. Now, I think the idea is that once you cut something, you can't uncut it. Right. Uh, so that's the, um, that's the concept of Sewer. 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 To turn. Well, what word does that sound like in English? Sewer. Sewer. What are you going to do if you smell the sewer? Turn. <laughs> turn. That's right. Ana. To answer. Avad. Avad. To serve. Okay, nouns. Uh, ozen. Ozen. Ear or feminine. Oh, sorry. Ear. It is a feminine noun. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Io. Io Ram. Um, Gabor. 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 Warrior. Mighty man. Um, Is this the word for the three hundred mighty man? You know the uh, probably like Nimrod. Well, no, Nimrod was on the mighty man. Like David's mighty man. No. But yeah, Nimrod would be the other one that would the warrior. Uh, I don't know. Zavok. Actually, the accent's on the first syllable. Zavok. Zavok. Sacrifice. Saraka. Saraka. Righteousness. We've had other forms of that, right? Sadi, righteous. We've had. Do we have pride? The verb form, Sada. Um, Safon. Safon. North, which is also a feminine. Uh, Oz. Oz. Then, since. Ba. Also, even. Um, pen. And less. Pen has a, a McKay. It's always attached to it. Next word it means less. All right. Questions on Cal and Perfect Strong Verbs? All right. Let's go on to the Cal Imperfect Weak Verb. Again, just like the Cal Perfect Weak Verbs, even in weak verbs, the Cal Perfect Endings. We're all always consistent. Okay. Um, same here. The performative, at least the consonant part of the performative, is always going to be the same. And if there's a subformative, that's always going to be the same. Okay. What's going to change is stuff in the middle. Because okay. that's that's the issue we're dealing with. The weak verb has weak letters somewhere, you know, first, second, or third consonant of the root. Right. Now, the weak verb has nothing to do with the preformative or the subformative. It has to do with the root itself, or, or the stem, I should say, stem or root. Right. So, if you have a guttural in the second position, the middle root letter, for example, here, a k, as in bakar, um, what happens? Well, it goes to yiv kar. What would we expect? Um, happily, they always give you the strong verb right there. Right? So where you expect yik to or yiv kor, you end up getting yiv kar. So in that case, you end up getting a patak as your root letter, or your uh, stem bell, I should say. See what I mean? I'm not going to worry about that. I still see the same performatives, the same subformatives. I still see, importantly, a heric under the preformative and a shiva under the second root letter. See that? That's Im it's important to note these things now because later we're going to be asking ourselves what is the difference between this and a PL? Or a nipple. In fact, let's just, I, I dog your this page for myself. You should do the same thing. Let's just get a broad overview here, real quickly. Now, we're going to look at this. I don't want you to remember any of this that we're looking at right now. Page, um, page 416. Okay? Um, do not remember any of this stuff that we're looking at right now. Okay? Promise? Yeah. All right. Um, the strong bird, page 416. I dog your the page because here is. The page that gives you um, all of the forms of the perfect and imperfect of all the different stems in the strong verb, right? The next page over gives you imperative, infinitive, construct, blah, 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 all right? But right now we're concentrating on the perfect and imperfect, right? All right, so you look at the cal, um, just look real quickly at the, uh, the perfect. Well, remember how we learned blank on top of the T? All right. Well, that's going to be consistent throughout all of these, right? Those endings are going to stay the same throughout all of these. Um, but what happens to the rest of the word? Well, as is indicated by the term nifal, what has happened? Nifal. I've added a noon to the beginning of the word, right? And under that noon is going to be a hiric, nifal, right? And nib all, so there's going to be a 
um, silent Shiva under the first root letter, right? And then I'm going to have a Pontok under the second root letter. See how that follows even the name Nifal? That's why they call it that, Nifal. So you have a Nifal imperfect. What's a Nifal imperfect look like? Like this. You have a noon on the front of it. So if you get a noon on the front of your vocabulary word that's a verb, what that's a huge indication, right? That you have an involve, right? All right, PL. What happens with the PL? We did this overview right before. What happens with the PL? Well, you don't get any added consonants, but the vowel points sound like PL. So the first, the first root letter has a, a heric under it. See, and then the um, the um, stem vowel is a serrate, typically, right? Also, another uh, another diagnostic indicator of the PAL is the dogish forte in the middle root letter. Now, that might not be there because if you have a guttural or rage, you're not going to need a dogish, right? But if you don't, then it's going to be there. The, the poo wall. See what happens with the poo wall? Vowel point. Yeah. See what happens with the hip field? We're going to add the, the, the hey to the front of the word. And <coughs> the stem vowel becomes hiric yod. Not in every form, but in a lot of them. Right? But that hip field on the front of my verb and blank a ta ta ti u tem tem u endings mark it out as a hip field perfect. See? Um, hopeful. What do you end up with? Well, you end up with a hey, but instead of a hiric, you have a kibbutz. Seriously, is there any reason why it's not a hopeful? No, it's named after the hopeful number two, which gives you a common statue. That's a good question, and that's a good answer. <laughs> All right. And then you, the hit pile is easy to see because you get a hey uh, tal on the front of your word. So the perfect's not that hard to deal with, right? We can, we can deal with that. In perfect, it's a little more difficult. Why? Because since we have a preformative, since we have a preformative on our imperfects, the nifal, uh, that noon's going to end up assimilating. So look under the nifal imperfect. How is that different? How is that different from the um, cal imperfect? Okay. Very importantly, here, here it is. The noon has assimilated into the first root letter. See the dogish? And you have a comet under the first root letter. You get an A-class vowel under the first root letter. See that? What do I get under the first root letter in a cow? Shiva. I have the same uh, heric in a nimble, but I can, so I'm going to be looking for that A class vowel under the first root letter. That's an indicator of a nimble, and if, unless I have a guttural, the dogish in the first root letter also will show me that assimilated noon, right? Um, PL. What happens? Well. I'm going to get another A class vowel under the first root letter, but I'm going to get that dogish in the middle root letter now, and a tsere stem vowel. So I'm going to get a patak under the first root letter, not a comment. Right? See where we're going to go next time in distinguishing these? We almost don't need to have to have, to have next term, because right? so I'm giving you all the answers. Now. What happens to a puol? Now I get a shiva under the performative. Uh, which is also which is also a characteristic of the uh, PL, right? Now I get a um, shiva under the performative and a kibbutz under the first root letter. PL and puol both have um, our intensive uh, stems, so they get a uh, dogish in the middle root letter. See all this? Look what happens with the hit field. I don't get a hay because I already have a performative. But what I get is a pontok under the performative. Right? And a shiva under the first root letter. See how those vowels are switching on me? That's what I'm going to need to learn in the future to distinguish them. The hofal, um, you can see the pattern that happens there. You get the kibbutz or the comets under the uh, performative. And the hit pile is easy. It's the only one where you get an added uh, performative. Uh, <coughs> you don't get the hay in the imperfect, but you get the top of the hit part there. So now I'm getting yit kateo. So that's pretty easy to distinguish right there.
Yes. So, um, you're not going to remember any of this because I asked you not to. But um, the point of that is, we're learning what we're learning now is so that later we can distinguish a cow imperfect from all the rest of those imperfect. Right. Strong verb is kind of easy. We just look at the strong verb right there. Well, it becomes a challenge with the weak verb. All right. So, if I'm looking at this chart on the bottom of page 174, um, I know it's going to be an imperfect because I'm noticing the preformative and the subformative and all that. That's not the hard part, right? The hard part is what makes it a count. Here it under the performative, shiva under the first root letter. Okay? All of those, that's consistent, isn't it? All right. Look at these other weak verbs on page 175. Same thing. Kirik under the first root letter, and Eshava, I'm sorry, Kirik under the performative, and Eshava under the first root letter. You see how that is still flowing through, flowing through uh, from our strong verb? Um, now I look at the chart on page 176. Same thing again. But now. But what happens to a hay? Anybody remember what happens to a hay? Sometimes it turns to a tom, sometimes it turns to a yo, and sometimes it just drops off. And here we're going to see it doing a lot of dropping off. And so that's what we need to remember. Um, with the, with the, on the chart on the previous page with the olive, you get a quiescent olive. That's not even hard to deal with. That's just not an issue right there, right? I feel like if you notice a spelling difference, right? <laughs> right? Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. The hay is going to drop off sometimes, though. So, you know, just be aware of that. But still, what's going to be my, my diagnostic indicator? Eric under the performative and a shiva under the first root letter. Cal imperfect. Right? That's what I gotta remember. All right, chart on page 178. Now I get my Kazakh um, sort of uh, words. Now these, now we get into ones that are just really gonna frustrate the tar because they're not following. I, I'm not getting, I'm not getting my hearing under the performative, but I'm not getting any A class value either. Remember those other ones? Remember the we saw the uh, the PL and the NIPL and the HIPL. All of those wanted A class vowels. Right, either a pontoc or a comma, it's either under the performative or the first root letter. I'm not getting an A class vowel here, right? In this one. Now, it's a little frustrating because in my type two, I am getting an A class vowel. Okay. Um, so, you know, these are just out of control. Yeah. Right. Type one versus type two. Well, it, it's just a couple different ways to, to form a weak verb with a guttural in the first position. Oh, okay, so it's not, it doesn't depend on what the guttural is to make it type one. It's a it That's, it will, it will. Okay. I mean, certain words will go one way and certain words will go another way. But it's not, oh, okay. But for instance, I, it, it, are you asking, how is one of type one meant that it was a hay and I would think yes, because it, because it's going to be you, you're going to with a k you're going to rather use a, a segol kind of a yechazak is a lot easier you know than yachazak or something I, I would imagine right? and the same thing with an i n you're going to want an i n it's kind of hard to do other than an a with an i n right okay. um, all right and then the chart on page one seventy nine <coughs> now Amar I'm sorry, that's uh, that's Asur. So this Aleph in the first position um, becomes a lot like this Kate in the first position, doesn't it? Right. Well, at least I'm not having eight class vowels here. Um, this type two guttural in the first stem uh, consonant position. That's that's a, a real confusion because now I'm having eight class vowels. Here. Although. Um, in many of those forms, I have a reduced A class vowel under the first root letter, but, but that, I don't know if that helps me much because in some I don't. All right, um, page 179. Now, Amar, we need to know that. You know, that's uh, you know going to appear uh, over and over, right? Especially with the above uh, reversing on it. See that? Yomar, Vayomar, right? 
uh, over and over. We saw that already in the text. You probably remember that. Right? So, um, that's, is that a Patak or a Tzeri? I think it's a Patak. Okay. So, Yomar, Tomar, Tomar, uh, Tomri, Omar. Notice what's happened here. And this is going to happen to us potentially when our vocabulary word starts with an Aleph. It didn't happen in the word to the left of it. I have two Alephs, right? But it does happen for Amar, the um, Aleph of the performative and the Aleph of the first um, letter of the stem just kind of assimilate and become one. And we've seen that happen before with other uh, words and other letters, right? Particularly the Tav. If a word ends in Tav and the perfect, perfect ending begins with Tav, sometimes you get stuck together with a Dagesh and kind of a Dagesh and all this, right? Um, so notice that that's happening. All right. Um, geminate verbs, remember, that have a double consonant? Um, like sabav or tamam. What is happening here? Bizarre stuff. Yaso, taso, taso. So it's not following our pattern, right? So what you need to know is there are weak verbs that just do not follow the pattern for the cal and perfect that we're learning. Right? Um, and by consonantal verbs, look at the top of page 182. Again, I'm having a, a comments under my performative, which completely freaks me out, right? Because that makes me think of a hit feel, right? Um, yakun, takun, yasin, and yavo. Um, unbelievable, huh? So many of the weak verbs, I can still use that if I have a hearing under the performative and a shiva under the first root letter. If that happens, if you see that, performative with a hearing under it, except for the first common singular that has a single word, right? all of them, but it's the only one. If I have a performative with a hearing under it and a first root letter with a shiva under it, I have a cal and perfect cal. Okay? On the strong verbs, it's consistent. It also follows through on many of the weak verbs. Okay. Some of the weak verbs, it doesn't. So here's what you got to do. Until you get used to particular verbs, if you have a weak verb that's not following through on that Kirik under the performative and Shiva under the root letter, the first root letter, if you have a weak verb that's not following that pattern, you're going to have to look it up to make sure what it is. Unless you know that verb is formed that way, and I recognize, or I, you'll recognize some of them pretty soon, like Vayomer, that's a cat. I'm not going to have to look that up more than 56 times, because, you know, I'm going to know that. Right. How, do you, how do you, you know, wouldn't one of the problems be, like if I just saw in the text, uh, you so, uh, I wouldn't know whether it was a verb or anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to identify it. I mean, you know, I looked under, probably under you, so. Where are you looking? Yes, yes, sir. Got it, yes, sir. Um, page 180, uh, 3 MS, Gemini, uh, stuff for, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, See, you, that, that's what I'm saying, like, uh, I mean, if I knew it was a verb, then it wouldn't be a neat, but then it probably wouldn't be so Because of the vowel point, so I wouldn't even recognize it for a verb. That's right, and that's you, and that you'll struggle with that, but not anymore because you just talked about it. Right? But you're going to have to ask yourself a question. Okay, what is going on here? There is a dogish in the Samek. Why is there a dogish in the Samek? Oh, the alternate, yeah. Because Gemini when they two consonants together will. Uh, yeah, I would say that's, that's there because you got a consonant dropping out. You also get in, get the doggish sometimes in the um, uh, in the bait. Not always, but sometimes in the bait too. It's kind of funny because sometimes it's when the two consonants double each other. When it would be, for instance, it would read yod samic samic bait. You just drop out the samic that you have. I know. This is odd, and this is this is what. Um, um, 
this is why it becomes a challenge just to know what to look up. Right? This is probably the hardest. If you saw you saw over one of these forms here, this is probably about the hardest type to deal with. Right? right? Um, because you, you, you may not think of Gemini nouns as doubling of a concept. Are the weak verbs and all the other aspects similar, like this? It's, it's just simply around. Yeah, it just gets different. And that's why we have a chapter on strong verbs, because that's the typical pattern. Weak verbs, variations. Strong verb, typical pattern. Weak verbs, variation. So, you know, the more experience you have, now we could just say, learn names. You know, Gemini type 1, alternate type 1, Gemini type 2, learn them. Got a mouse, broke memory. Bam, 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 bam. Well, that's what it would be. It'd be like, once you just hit me with a sledgehammer, right? Um, probably more effective use of our time to say, let's see what you can get used to by reading the text, and you're still always going to be reduced to looking some stuff up, right? For as long as you live, you're going to have to look up some weak verbs. If you don't like that, memorize the form. I mean, I don't want to go for it, right? Um, but I'm just telling you, if you can recognize a weak verb, if a consonant is missing, it's a weak verb, right? Or if it has a consonant that, that is weak in it, it's a weak verb. So if you recognize, I have a weak verb, it's following my cow pattern, you know, great, I'll go with it, it's a cow. Not all of them do, so I'm happy, right? So if I have a weak verb, and it's not following my cow pattern, and I'm not used to it, uh, another one is Vayelik. That's an imperfect, a Cal imperfect from Halak, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you're gonna, but now you know you're gonna see that so many times. Vayelik, and he went, and he walked, or some other form of that. And so, you know, I'm not gonna have to look that up. I know that. So, you know, the ones that really occur a lot, you're gonna get used to, and you're gonna know uh, as irregulars, right? As weak words. Um, you know, you can you can memorize these if you want to, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> right? uh, I'll I'll look them up when I come to them if I don't recognize them, just to make sure what I'm doing. With it. Right? And so that that's pretty much where we're at with them. Okay, and then um, uh, by consonantal verbs, remember that the um, dictionary form is the infinitive construct: kun, seem, and bo. Um, what's happening with those? Top of page 182. Those aren't that hard, and the reason they're not that hard uh, in terms of recognizing the vocabulary form is because if I take out the performative and the subformative, I pretty much have the vocabulary form there, right? Um, yakun, takun. But the problem is I don't have my I don't have the, the vowel pointing I'm expecting for a cow. So that that's what's freaking me out. There. So again, um, now if I can remember, yakum and yasiv and yavo, you know these you can almost remember that these by consonantal um, verbs uh, are formed in this way in the Cal perfect. That's you know I've got comments on the performative and an infinitive construct form. You can probably you can probably remember that kind of a thing and, and be helped by that, right? Um, but otherwise, uh, next, uh, I believe, well, the next, on page 133, the next um, group of wheat birds, um, here it is. Um, <laughs> Yeshe, Teshe, that is not following any cow sort of bell point pattern that I'm used to. Or shoe, right? Uh, there's halak. See it? Yele, yele, tele, tele, tele ki, ele, etc. So that's formed irregularly, right? I'll get used to that. And then yarash. Uh, that's kind of odd because yarash here is actually. Maintaining that first yod, I expect it to drop out, but it doesn't. Right? So I've got a double yod there, which is an odd thing. But in this order, it 
stays there. They just kind of go on and on, don't they? But the bottom line is, basically, if it's not following the cow pattern and it's a weak curve, and you're not familiar with it, look it up. Um, here are some here are some words on the bottom of page 185 that occur a lot. Uh, asa, to do or make. Um, you know, it'd be a good thing to be aware of that pattern. You might recognize it as a cow. Uh, Ra'a. Um, that's one that you might want to be aware of and recognize that pattern. Although with that one, I pretty much have my typical cow pattern, don't I? Look at that. Here with the shiva under the first root letter. So I'm kind of good to go on telling that's a cow I'm perfect, right? And I'm not missing um, too many letters. Once in a while I'm missing a hay. The hay's dropping out once in a while, right? But not too often. So that one's not too bad. Haya is one you really ought to get familiar with because that's the verb to be, right? Um, it's irregular, but um, we will get familiar with it one way or another. It's, it's good to notice it right here. But again, fortunately, that one's following our cow pattern, isn't it? Kirik under the performative, Shiva under the first root letter. So. That's not too bad. The hardest part about that one is recognizing that it's from um, Haya. Um, the third masculine plural is a little tough. The second masculine plural is a little tough because the hay is dropping out on us, right? Even the, the second feminine singular, the hay is dropping out. Uh, all of these, Yatsa, Nasa, um, Natan. Look what happens with um, Nasa. Uh, the noon pretty much goes away and gets assimilated into the first root letter, doesn't it? You don't have a dogish, though. Um, Natan, that's one that we, we saw on Natan, right? It was just all totally freaked out and, and we went, wow. Uh, but here's the form of uh, Natan. And you know, sometimes half the word is gone. Lecoq is another one that does strange things, remember? All right. So, you know, we can get familiar uh, with these. And frankly, I don't know why he asked you to memorize the ones he asked you to memorize, because the ones you're memorizing are all verbs that follow the typical cow pattern, not with the, not with the stem vowel. The stem vowel changes, but I don't really care too much about the stem vowel. If I've got a hierarch under the performative and a shiva under the first root letter, I'm fairly happy. Right? Yeah. But if I have a weak verb that doesn't follow that pattern, and I ha I'm not experienced with it, I should look it up to make sure what, what I have there. Dictionary remains your best friend. Unless you're an animal, you just want to remember it's always there. You know, well, here, of course, we've been around a number of seminaries now. What's the typical approach to Hebrew? Is it very similar? We just kind of go into it and learn some vocabulary and learn the rest in great part of reading? Or is it pretty much real memorization? I don't think we're far off of what's typical in Hebrew classes. You know, I, I think this text would be pretty typical. And, and the way we're doing it is pretty typical. Um, some times they will give you these flow charts like that you can use uh, for parsing words. And I've got some of those from a couple of people. I would never really use one. Um, I can give a copy to you probably. Um, probably will. You know, where you work through this thing. If it has this, then go here. If it has this, go here. If it has this, go here. But if it has this and not this, go here. You know, and all of a sudden, pretty soon, you get down to the end, you go, oh, well, that's a cow invented construct. You know, and it, and it does that for you. Well, I don't know. I mean, you're going to carry around a piece of paper. Maybe, I guess you can stick that piece of paper in your Bible. That'd, that'd be all right. You want to have a piece of paper. Right? 
while you're doing that, I'll look it up on PDB and find the form and be done with it. Um, that means you have to carry that. Yeah, that's right. But I'm going to have to have that for a piece of paper? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, in terms of parsing, but the trouble is, you know, I can parse it, but I have no idea what it means. Yeah, you still have that, but anyway. And, you know, when I was uh, taking beginning Hebrew, I remember um, they never counted off for parsing now. Because, you know, you'd have a chunk of text and say, okay, translate that and parse all the verbals. That's what we had to do all the time. And, you know, a lot of the nouns look pretty verbalish. <laughs> and I know I parsed a lot of nouns. But I, if, I, if there was any doubt, you know, I'd parse it because you didn't get counted off for that. And in a sense, how can you get counted off? Because a lot of the nouns actually derive from some verbal form. So in a sense, you almost can't parse it in terms of how it got derived, you know, from the artist or something like that. So that's why they didn't take off for it, because in one sense, it does derive from a verbal form, and you're recognizing that, you know. Um, but... You know, if I'm not recognizing vocabulary and things like that. So, yeah, you know, it's, having that piece of paper is not as helpful as you might think because, you know, is it really a verb? What, you know, uh, you know, what's the vocabulary? What does it mean? You know, uh, if, if vocabulary weren't an issue, then that piece of paper and your Bible, you'd probably just go. Um, I need to do some checking. Uh, because I'm not up, as up to speed on what might be available in the last five years or so. But, you know, if we had something like the Pope for Hebrew Bible, would that be awesome? Cool. And something like the what? The Pope. Oh. Well, we'd have to be in the Greek class to know that. Um, there are some resources. Oh, well, this is a little counter reference to the Divine Pope. Okay. Um, so, Adam, I don't know, maybe that's your life uh, work. Find Hebrew Pope. Create a Hebrew post. Be the Pope. On 411 under Hebrew lexicons, next term, I need to tell him to order these, by the way. Thanks for reminding me that we're going to get holiday uh, as a good lexicon for the meeting. And you'll appreciate that for just translating and stuff like that. Uh, you need to have BDB to do serious exegesis, but the holiday is good for BDB. Are we going to get into, you know, either later in this class or in other classes, get into more of what's going on in BDB? Because I'm looking at most of that stuff. Like, I feel like lost, you know, and I can piece it. You know, I can go, I can follow, say, an entry. And I can find a couple English words and say, well, that must be the definition. But it's all the other stuff that I'm just like, the reference in this and that. And I, I don't know why. Like a class, just even a short, like an hour long class. Kind of yeah, there's a chapter in here, I think. I'm, maybe I'm mistaken about that. But I think maybe there's another grammar I looked at. But I think there's a chapter in here. There's a chapter in here on Hebrew. Well, right. two, two nights and yesterday, or two nights ago and last night, trying to work through the group 111 through 16 just completely getting lost trying to find these these things that's right just going through the entries I was just I was like I don't that's I'm right. having a hard time even find the definition of some of these things I'm having a hard time knowing which entries are derivations of the other entry and which ones are separate right and well of course there's an appendix 446 page 446 gives us um Oh, I'm sorry. That is the Hebrew lexicon, so that's not about the Hebrew lexicon. Um, that was kind of silly. Uh, a tool to use. Yeah, that is a good tool to use. Um, uh, I guess it was the grammar we didn't use had a chapter on the uh, the lexicon. But no, we've just started that. We talked some about it. I mean, we just is it is it one of these things that this tool is so powerful we just need to wait to learn it later? Or is it something that we can start learning? Well, we're, we've already started. But well, I know we've started, but I mean, as far as there's... Like, I've used stuff in the past where it's like you learn how to use this little portion of it, but you got to wait until you progress in your knowledge to start using the other part. Well, to some extent, but not anymore. I mean, yeah. but it's just a matter of when we're going to take the time to do it now. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, to some extent, we're, we're easing you into it. And, um, you know, even tonight, we're going to do some more of it. 
Um, hopefully, if we can yeah, get to that. But yeah, we're going to do some more of that tonight. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more and more about it. So by the time we finish next term, you should be fairly comfortable with BDB. Okay. And even, in the, even in the next term, you know, they, I don't know what he, whether he's going to talk about it, but you'll certainly get some practice with it. And the other lexicon as well. So we'll have, we'll have the two lexicons. What are the differences? You know, uh, what are you going to use this one for primarily? What are you going to use this one for primarily? I mean, you can use them both for everything, but one's better at one thing than the other is better at the other. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk more about BDB. We'll do it tonight. Okay. So. All right, let's take a break unless there are any other questions. we got vocabulary to do at the end of this chapter. Uh, 189. One eighty nine. Uh, karav. Karav. To draw near. Chata. Chata. To miss or sin. Interesting that the Hebrew word and the Greek word are similar in concept. Um, yarash. Yarash. To subdue or possess, dispossess, inherit. Um, Rava. To become numerous or be great. Um, Yasaf. Yasaf. To add. Um, Nata. To turn or stretch out. Uh, Azav. Azav. To leave or abandon. Ga'al. Ga'al. To redeem. Um, Kafar. Uh, to cover. I wonder how um, coincidental that is that, that is very similar to the English words. Kafar, cover. Probably coincidental, but it helps. Um, shata, to drink. Tamam, to be complete. Kam, Hand or palm, rea, 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 friend, fellow, companion. Again, there's a lot of reish ayan words with all kinds of different meanings. So uh, distinguish this from the vowel pointing. Uh, rea, friend, fellow, companion, and then um, neged, neged, before or opposite. All right, let's take a break for about ten minutes.